I particularly want to talk about the primary and the middle school geometry curriculum because I think many of the problems in high school geometry stem from a lack of sufficient understanding of how to treat geometry in the primary and the middle school years. Let us look at the Russian research that was carried out in the late 1960s. They found, for example, that in the first five years from their analysis, that pupils were expected to become acquainted to level one activities with only about 12 to 15 geometrical objects. But then when they went to grade six, after the first five years, they were expected to become acquainted with a hundred new geometric objects, as well as the terminology, but also at level three understanding. So not only was there in the first month in grade six, a huge jump in the number of new geometric objects that they had to learn, but there was a jump from level one to level three. And clearly this was creating huge problems for learners. In fact, they described, the Russians described the progression from grades one to five as a prolonged period of geometric inactivity where they were doing a lot of arithmetic but very little geometry. Subsequently, the Russians redesigned their curriculum uh, to introduce more geometry. If we look at the South African context, in a study carried out by myself and a student in 1987, we found that 45% of students in KwaZulu-Natal, in a rural area of KwaZulu-Natal, in grade 12 had only mastered level 2 or lower, whereas the examination, we write a national examination in South Africa, required mastery at level 3 and beyond. So clearly almost half the students were not at the le required level for the examination. And it clearly it explains why students were having difficulty with our national examination. If we look at countries that are successful in geometry education, in particular Eastern countries like Japan and Taiwan, for example, uh, we find that Wu and Ma report in a study in 2006 that grade six learners were already 28%, almost 30% of the students were already at Van Hiller level three. And the reason for that is that they start very early in grade one introducing concepts of and developing concepts of congruency, of similarity, more or less according to the Van Hiller theory through a lot of visualization and tessellation activities uh, and this seems to help students to progress much more quickly towards Van Hiller level three. However, in South Africa, by contrast, as I, in the study that I reported already in 1987, only about 30% of students were at Van Hiller level three in grade 11. Uh, and a more recent study in 2005 found that in grade seven, only 17% of students were at Van Hiller level two. So clearly in South Africa, where there is a lack of geometry in the primary school, uh, we uh, have big problems. And I suspect this is the same in many other countries, including uh, Brazil, and certainly I know in the United States uh, and uh, in countries, in some European countries, uh, this is problematic. So let us look at some activities suggested by the Van Hiller theory. There's a very strong focus on tessellations. In the uh, study by Dina Van Hiller in 1958, now she did not use technology. Uh, she relied a lot on students using cardboard tiles to create tilings. 
And I think those activities are still very important. Of course, nowadays we have technology which can supplement those activities, not replace them, because I think the hands-on activity is important and technology can never replace that. But I think technology has advantages, particularly dynamic geometry like Sketchpad, GeoGebra, Gabri and other software, where we can do dynamic transformations, which is impossible with concrete tiles. And that, I think, can aid conceptual understanding. I'm going to demonstrate this with technology uh, simply because of the convenience of it in a setting such as this. If we take an arbitrary scalene triangle like this, we can create a tessellation by constructing the midpoint of one of its sides, marking that as a center of the side, uh, as a center of rotation, and then by selecting the interior of the triangle, I can rotate it through 180 degrees, a half turn, and I will just change the color for the sake of convenience to say blue. And now we have created a parallelogram. And we know from the properties of a parallelogram that opposite sides are equal and parallel. And now we can use translations to create a tessellation very easily from that. Uh, by marking a vector and selecting the interior of the triangles, we can now translate in a horizontal direction uh, very easily um, to create a one-dimensional pattern. Of course, the tessellation is not one-dimensional, it is two-dimensional. So we need to translate in another direction, and I am selecting the two points there and marking that as a vector by which we can now translate the one-dimensional pattern in that direction to create a two-dimensional pattern, which we call a tiling or, or a translation. Now, an improvement in, in the South African curriculum is that tessellations are now prescribed in the curriculum, as it probably is in many other curricula. Um, however, when I look at how it is often treated in textbooks and how teachers, uh, having observed how teachers deal with tessellations, is that they only see tessellations as an interesting link, perhaps with art, and especially with the kind of work produced by Escher. And of course, that is a useful link and creates interest, and particularly for students that are artistically inclined, it is very good to make that link. However, there is more to tessellations than just the artistic aspect of it. I think we should focus on the embedded geometry within the tessellations. Just creating them and saying, aha, that is beautiful, is not enough. Uh, Dina van Hiller, for example, emphasizes that when students have produced tessellation patterns like these tilings, either by hand, as well as I would suggest nowadays with technology, because students can print these out, is to investigate and identify parallel lines. And we can see many parallel lines running in this direction. We see parallel lines running in this direction. We see parallel lines running in that direction. And of course, because it is dynamic, we can drag it and we can see it in different orientations, which I think is useful when students have dynamic geometry like this, or even if they have a drawing on paper, they can turn the paper and visualize it in different orientations. And one of the difficulties I know from teaching geometry for over 30 years is that students 
have great difficulty sometimes recognizing parallel lines in different orientations because of the static way in which it is often presented in textbooks. Um, so just doing that activity alone is a very good activity. Then she suggests students finding what she calls ladders and saws. Uh, for example, if I can just draw a line segment in there, for example, identifying this as a, what she would call a saw, or what we normally call alternate angles. Obviously, this angle is equal to that one because I can pick this triangle up and give it a half turn to fit exactly onto this one. But she suggests using the name of saw because it looks like the ragged teeth of a saw. And obviously this continues. We have a saw continuing all across there. This angle is equal to it and continuing. And we have many saws in different directions. Here we have another saw uh, going uh, in that direction, etc. Encouraging students to mark these and color it in and improving their ability to visualize and identify these saws. Obviously, when the tessellation pattern looks differently, then they have to identify it in a different orientation. I'm just dragging it back to that orientation. Of course, we can now also identify other angles that are the same. And let me perhaps just draw in another segment there very quickly. For example, here we have what she calls a, a ladder where that angle is equal to that one through a translation. I can pick this triangle up and move it to that one and it is clear that this triangle, this angle rather, fits exactly onto that angle and she calls that a ladder. It looks like a ladder that is lying somewhat on its side. And of course we have many ladders. We have Ladders that progress in different directions. We have a ladder in this direction. This angle is equal to that one. You can see this is parallel to that and normally we call those corresponding angles. Of course, this angle is also equal. So we have a whole series of these angles equal. And this is all at the visual level. 